Hello, everybody. Everybody doing good? All right, all right. Grab a seat. We're going to get started. Uh, my name is Spencer. If I haven't met you yet, I'd like to. Um, so uh, we're going to get started. We got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to jump right in. Uh, this session's going to be on prayer and Bible reading. How many of y'all have been here before? Oh, a lot. Okay, great. How many of y'all have been to a session on how to study the Bible here before? Okay, a lot of people. Yeah, we've taught a lot of sessions on how to study the Bible, and we've taught them from a lot of different angles. I've taught um, seven different versions of how to study the Bible, and for the last like 13 years, I've taught a session on how to study the Bible. And so it's such an important topic for us to know, man, how do we study our Bibles? And so that's what most of the Bible study uh, breakouts have focused on thus far, thus far, is how do we do it? How do we study the Bible? What, what are the methods that we use? And I want to point you to those breakouts and say you should go listen to breakouts that uh, several guys have taught on how to study the Bible. But I think for most of us, the problem isn't that we don't know how to study the Bible. It's not like we're confused on, man, what do I do in studying the Bible? The problem's not that we don't know how. The problem's just that we don't do it. That's the reality. It's not that we're confused on how to read the Bible. It's just that it's not a priority. It's just that we just don't ever do it. And so, man, what I want to do, I just want to give a simple, nothing more other than a reminder of how important it is that we read the Bible and that we pray. And so let me, uh, let me pray for us, and then we'll, we'll jump right in. Jesus, I pray that you would guard and guide my mouth as we speak, God. I pray that your spirit would just speak to us through your word, through the verses that we'll look at. I pray that you would speak to us even as far as like, how our schedule rolls, and when we can spend time making our mornings or our evenings about one thing only, about meeting with you. And God, I pray that you would help us to be disciplined, to study the word, and that our hearts would just come alive because of that. We love you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. So I got three kids. I've got a nine-year-old girl, a seven-year-old girl, and a six-year-old boy. And uh, they're awesome. And so I taught them all how to ride a bike. And um, my son, he learned when he was three. And so what I did to teach him how to ride a bike is I, probably what your dad did. Uh, I ordered a book on bike riding. So I bought him a bike, of course. But, uh, so he's got the bike over here, but I ordered a book. And so basically this book just talks about like angle of your shin when you're pedaling, you know, different styles of pedaling, gear shifting, things like that. And so we worked through this whole book together to teach him, you know, how to ride a bike. And then you probably like your dad did, right? So then we go on YouTube and we watch a bunch of videos on proper bike riding technique. And it was great. He was learning how to ride a bike, right? And so then I, brought, I actually hired a guy from Atlanta. And he came up and did lessons, like, not like on the bike, but did like lessons on bike theory. And, uh, and it, man, it was awesome. And so finally, like, Jay, he's got the lessons. He's got the charts. He's got the YouTube videos. He's got the book. And so then I'm like, all right, Jed. It's your time, boy. You know how to ride a bike. Jump on there and go. And so he hops on this bike and goes. Pah! So I threw his bike away. Because it just wasn't working for him. So uh, some of y'all are looking at me like I actually killed my son. No, it's a joke story. Like no one learns how to ride a bike like that, right? How did you learn how to ride a bike? You rode a bike, right? Now people can give you some tips that if, that's going to make it easier. But the only way you're going to get better at riding a bike is by riding a bike. The only way that you are going to get better at studying the Bible is just by studying the Bible. For some of us, we've, we've sat through so many charts, seen so many videos, read so many books. And it, man, it's time to just get on the bike and ride. So what I want to do, I want to look at Luke chapter 10. All right, Luke chapter 10. We're going to look at the story of Mary and Martha, if you guys are familiar with that story. It's a great story. And actually, Little, uh, Brody's wife, plays the drums over here. Uh, she spoke on this passage at our women's conference. And, man, it really impacted me. I was listening to it via podcast. Uh, and so... <laughs> I had a wig and I was hiding. Uh, <laughs> so good. Uh, so she, she spoke on this passage and she was relating it to uh, studying the Bible. I never thought of it this way before. The passage is of, is of Mary and Martha. So let me read the passage. It's in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 36. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. 
And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the good portion, which won't be taken away from her. It's a real simple, real short story, but there's so much in it. All right, so picture the scene. All right, so Jesus is traveling. How many people came to Mary and Martha's house, do you think? It's not just Jesus. So think, think through the story in your head and think about, well, Jesus didn't just roll alone. He went with a lot of folks. In fact, in this same chapter, he just sent out 72 people from the crowd that goes around with him. So he's got a huge crowd around him. So how many people is Martha cooking for? Who knows? Does your mom get freaked out when you have company over? Okay, so imagine your mom is cooking solo for 50 or 100 that are coming to your house. And my mom would always just be like, we got to do everything. We got to windex the windows. We got to go wipe off the countertops. I'm imagining Martha just being like that, like, let's go, let's go. Now, Martha, why is she serving Jesus? Why is she, why is she cooking a meal for Jesus? Man, she loves Jesus. Like Martha gets a bad rap because her attitude wasn't great. Well, we're not going to focus on that. Let's focus on the good part of what Martha's doing. Man, she's serving Jesus. She wants to, Jesus is traveling away from home. She wants to provide a good experience for him, a little home-cooked meal for him. She wants to make sure he has a good time, a restful time. She invites him in. So you got this, these two sisters and a brother, Mary, Martha, and then Lazarus is their brother. Y'all remember him, the guy Jesus raised from the dead? Some people believe that this story happens after they raised Lazarus, after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. I don't know. But, so they knew Jesus. They had a friendship with Jesus, and Jesus would stop there pretty often. So imagine the scene, Jesus and all these guys roll up, and Martha's like, Oh, it's go time. Fried chicken's on, all right? Get everything going. Wipe down these countertops. Oh, shoot. I got to make sure the vacuum lines are in the rug. All right, got it going, got it going. And every time she passes by the living room, she's looking in there. She's on her way to do something. She looks in there, and Jesus is teaching. And you know Martha had to be like, man, I really want to listen to that. But water's boiling. All right, let's go over here. She's cooking things. Okay, and she's stopping by, and she sees that her sister is just sitting there with Jesus not helping out. She's just sitting there and she's just listening to Jesus, sitting at his feet, listening to Jesus. And Martha's getting more and more frustrated. I'm imagining she really wants to listen, but she's also got lunch. And so she's, oh, oh man, that story sounds good. You know, going over here and wiping something down. She's coming back and, oh, I wish I could hear that. Hey, hey, come back to that. Come back to that one though. You know, and like every time she passes by the door, she wants to hear. And finally her frustration builds to where she's like, okay, pause. Jesus, don't you care? I'm, I'm working my butt off. Don't you care? Tell her to come help me. And what Jesus says is really beautiful. He says, Martha, you're distracted by a lot of things, but one thing is necessary, and Mary chose that. I'm not going to take it away from her. What's Mary doing? The one thing that she's doing, the one thing that she's focused on is meeting with Jesus. Just meeting with Jesus. Because imagine the opportunity. The creator is in your living room. Picture your living room right now and picture Jesus sitting in it. What would you do? Like, you, you get to ask him any question you want. Where, why mosquitoes, Jesus? Why mosquitoes? Like, ask him any question you want. Like, whatever it is that's on your mind, you get to talk to Jesus. Imagine the opportunity. It's crazy. She's probably been looking forward to this for weeks and weeks. Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. Or maybe it's just that day and she's like, today's my day. But Whatever it is, she's got just one thing on her mind. Martha is distracted by many, many things. Mary's putting away all other, even good things aside so that she can meet with Jesus. Man, let me pause for a second and just say this. A lot of the stuff that you struggle with, you know what your struggles are. A lot of the stuff that you struggle with, if you just spent time with Jesus, they'd be resolved. That's it. Your attitude, your love for sin, other loves that creep in, your identity issues, if you daily sat down with Jesus in your living room, a lot of those things would be resolved. Martha's worried about a lot of things. Mary's worried about one thing, one thing. You see this as a theme in the scriptures. David says, uh, one thing I ask of you, Lord, one thing I want that I can dwell in your house. Mary here is concerned with one thing. So little in this message that she taught, she kind of coined the phrase, one thing mornings. Basically, make your mornings about one thing. 
meeting with Jesus. Be like Mary. Make your mornings about one thing or make your evenings about one thing or your afternoons. Wherever it is, just have one thing that you do. One thing. And if you do that, a lot of the stuff you struggle with will be resolved. So how do we do it? Jesus obviously literally isn't in our living room. So how do we do it? Well, well, he's meant for us to meet with him right here with the scripture, in the scripture, through the book. This is how God has revealed himself to us. If you want to meet with Jesus daily, it happens right here in the scriptures, you and Jesus alone. Read a quote, a guy named David Mathis. He said, so why do we read the Bible? To know and enjoy Jesus. This is the highest task of Bible reading. Not to internalize a dry list of do's and don'ts, nor to find instruction or wisdom for living primarily, but to know and enjoy more of God. To know and enjoy more of God. So uh, Philippians 3, uh, verse 8. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. It says, uh, Paul's talking. He says this. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of their surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He's saying even good things I count as a loss because I found a better thing. That one thing. Mary has chosen the one good portion. I'm not going to take that away from her. So that one thing. So focus on that one thing. The goal of Bible reading is that in your hearts, God would be known and glorified. This isn't just something you check off as to be a good Christian. The goal is that your hearts would come alive because you're actually meeting with Jesus in your living room. That's the goal. And you know what's going to happen as you meet with Jesus daily? You're going to grow and you're going to mature and sin's voice is going to get quieter. Christ's voice is going to get louder and you're going to start looking more and more like him. But the main thing is your heart's going to come alive because our hearts were made for God, but they love other things. Your heart loves whatever it loves. Basketball, art, music, friends, all these other things that are competing for our loves. But we need God's truth to penetrate our hearts to make these other things dimmer and to let his love be seen for what it really is, is better, 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 better. That one thing. Second Corinthians four, six says this for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. That's crazy. Pause for a second. He's saying, in the beginning, you remember when God said, let there be light. He's saying, God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Not, this says, this God has shined in our hearts to give knowledge of Jesus, to give knowledge of God, not the knowledge of more verses. See what I'm saying? God's goal isn't that you would just learn a bunch of dry verses, is that you would know Christ, not know more verses. We'll talk about the importance of memorization in a minute, but not that you would, the goal isn't that you would know more verses. The goal is that you would know Christ more. So why should you read the Bible? Let me give just uh, two points on why should we read and then a couple practical tips on when you read. Why should we read the Bible? Number one is what we've been talking about already, that God makes himself known to us through reading the Bible. That's a second Corinthians four, six. He shines in our hearts. He, he opens our hearts to make himself known to us through reading the Bible. The second thing is not only do we know God and meet with God like Mary by reading the Bible. The second thing is God changes us through reading the Bible. God changes you through reading the Bible. There's a verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18. You might want to write that verse down. 2 Corinthians 3.18. Super good. He's talking about Moses and this veil that's over his face. So that's, that's why he says this. He says this. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another. What does that mean? He says, we, beholding the glory of the Lord. What does that mean? We looking at the Lord, looking at Jesus, are being transformed or changed, are being transformed into that same image. What does that mean? Looking at Jesus, we're starting to look like Jesus. The more you look at Jesus, the more you look like Jesus. Beholding the glory of the Lord, we're being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another. Little by little by little. You study the word and you're going to start to look more like Jesus. It's going to start to change you from the inside. I promise if you look at Jesus every day through the scripture, I promise your life is going to be changed. It is. If you aren't seeing change in your life, maybe you're not seeing Jesus enough in the word. I promise he's going to change you. How does he do it? And he changes us from the inside, even on our wants. 
Not just our knowledge on the outside. He changes our wants on the inside. In John 15, uh, I want to read a couple verses that talk about how he changes us through the scriptures. John 15, 11, it says, these things have I spoken to you. Now that's Jesus talking, but we can take it as these things have I spoken to you from the word. These things have I spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. John 15, 17, these things I command you so that you'll love one another. John 16, 1, I've said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. Romans 10 talks about faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So these verses alone tell us that love, joy for others, perseverance, and faith, they come out of reading the Bible. They come out of the words that Jesus has said to us. We could go on and on and on with verses about that. But the first thing, why should we read is because it's meeting with God. The second thing is because it actually changes us. When we read the scripture, we are, the more we look at Jesus, the more we slowly, day by day, little by little, start to look like Jesus. And the verse says, this isn't something we do. This isn't legalism. This comes from the Lord, who's the spirit. Jesus does that because he's a good daddy. He's a good God. He changes us because he wants to. It's really awesome. So let me give some practical tips for when you read. Now, again, we've done breakouts on different Bible study topics. And, and I think, we, you know, we pinpointed, here's what I think you should do. If you're struggling with that, go listen to those breakouts because those are, uh, that's not the scope of this breakout. But what I want to do is I just want to give a few practical tips on when you read. And the first tip is going to have a video that goes along with it. The first tip is don't read passively. What I mean by that is Don't just fly through passages of scripture and not stop and think about what it means. So I want to show a video and then we'll talk about it some more, kind of illustrating this. Don't don't read passively, but actively engage your mind in thinking and looking. All right, so watch this video and we'll come back. I once heard a story about a professor. A student approached him, curious about scientific observation, very well, said the professor as he pulled out a huge yellow jar. Take this fish and look at it. Eventually, I'll test it. The student took the fish and began to observe it. He looked at it, studied it. After 10 minutes, he thought he'd see everything that could be seen. He searched for the professor, but he was nowhere to be found. So, he kept looking at the fish. 30 minutes, an hour, two hours passed. He's turning it over, looking in the eyes behind, beneath.
That video is awesome, isn't it? Oh, man, that video is so helpful to me. Just thinking about, take a passage. The, let's pause for a second and don't get too nerdy about it. Just look at it. Just look at it and look at it and look at it some more. And, man, Christ will make it come alive to you. We did this in a miniature way when we just looked at Mary and Martha. We looked at that story, and then we stopped and thought and said, how many people were, were there at our house? What, it would, what would it have been like? What, did Mary, what was Mary probably like? What was Martha probably thinking? You know, part of that's speculation, but part of that's just looking and looking and looking and looking. If you do that, it's going to make your Bible study come alive. Do these two things. Make your mornings about one thing, and then when you read, Look, 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 look. If those two things can stick in your head, man, you're going to grow immensely. You're going to grow a ton, I promise. So make your mornings about one thing. Second thing is don't read passively, read actively. Man, sometimes you'll look and look and look in one verse, and it'll be more than you can handle. Sometimes you'll look and look and look, but the passage is going to be long. I can't tell you how to do that. There's, There's time and place for both of those. Just look and look and look and look. This is called meditation. When the scripture talks about meditation, it's not some weird hippie incense thing. It's, it's just looking, looking and thinking and looking and thinking. Okay, when you read, number one, don't read passively. Number two, reading the Bible is work. So keep working. And you know what? Uh, this guy named R.C. Sproul, he says this about Bible reading. He said, reading the Bible is work, and because of the curse, it's harder than entertainment. It is. That's why Instagram is easier than Scripture. It's not work. It's entertainment, right? Reading the Bible is work, and so sometimes it is hard, right? Instagram is not very hard. It doesn't require much of you, but it doesn't give very much to you, right? So reading the Scripture is hard, and I'll tell you when it gets especially hard to look, 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 is it's easy to look, look, look in a story, but it's harder when you get into a book like Romans, and what you're looking at are just words, but When you look at it, you look, 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 and see how those words fit together and what God's actually saying to you, it's going to explode. I mean, it's going to come alive in a way that stories don't. It's going to be huge, but it takes more work. And because of the curse, work is hard. And so it's going to be hard work to do it, but it's going to be worth it. Number three, don't go to the Bible to just get a prescription for your specific situation. I know a lot of folks read the Bible and they're like, all right, I'm going to look. But the, what I want to look at is I want to look at verses that have to do with anxiety because I feel anxious a lot. All right, so go in the back. I look for verses on anxiety. Can that be helpful sometimes? Absolutely. Yeah, that can be helpful. Should that be your primary method of Bible study? No, probably not. Right? But if you... If you go into Scripture and you're looking at a story, looking at a passage of the Scripture, working through a book of the Scripture, working through a book of the Bible, and your heart is being changed by the Lord and your heart's coming alive, He, the Spirit will work on your anxiety. The Spirit will work on those issues that you wanted to pinpoint. So don't go primarily and use the Bible as, as a pharmacy and put in your prescription on, on what you're dealing with, but just read and have your heart changed, and God's going to work through those issues. A lot of things you struggle with, if you just spent time with Jesus, those things would be resolved. Number four, this one's important. Don't just get facts. Don't just go in there and learn a bunch of cold, empty facts. This isn't just fact accumulation. Remember, the people that Jesus opposed the most in the New Testament knew the most, had the most Bible knowledge in their heads, right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees, Jesus blasted these guys over and over and over because they knew so much Bible, but they knew so little Jesus. It's crazy. There's one story he tells in Matthew 22. You don't have to turn there, uh, but it says this. The Sadducees come up to Jesus with this super complex question, and the way that he answers it is really funny. Now, remember, these guys are guys that would memorize, memorize the Old Testament, at least the first five books of it. Those books are long, real long. And even in a world without Netflix, that would be a big job to do, right? And so, man... Imagine these guys, they have so much Bible packed in their heads. They could, they could rattle off Bible for a couple of hours for you. And they come up to Jesus with this question. Look at his answer. The same day, Sadducees came to Jesus, and they say there's no resurrection. So they asked Jesus a question, saying, Teacher, Moses says if a man dies and he doesn't have children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. So there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and having no kids, he left his wife to his brother. So the second one and the third, all the way down to the seventh brother. After them all, the woman died. So in the resurrection, therefore, 
of the seven men, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. What a weird question, right? They're playing off of a, a deep Bible knowledge, and they're saying, all right, so this guy, you know, he's married to this woman, and he dies, and so his brother marries the woman, and then he dies, and then his brother marries the woman, and it goes through seven different brothers, and finally the lady dies. So when they're resurrected, whose wife will she be? And you know what Jesus' answer is? Wrong. That's it. Like, that's his answer. Wrong. It's awesome. Obviously, I thought it was funnier than you did, but... <laughs> That's okay, because uh, that's funny to me, because they like, got this complex question. All right, so Jesus answered them, you are wrong, because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. All right, pause for a second. Did these guys know the scriptures? Yeah. So imagine when Jesus says, you don't know the scriptures, everybody around went, ooh, I can't believe you just said that. That guy quoted Genesis to me this morning, like all of it, all of Genesis. They, it, you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. And he gives an answer to their question. And he says this, in the resurrection, people don't marry. They don't, they don't marry or are given in marriage. They're like angels in the heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, he says, haven't you ever read? Ooh, haven't you ever read what was said to you by God? I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. They weren't astonished at his answer. They're astonished that he's saying to these guys who'd memorized such huge portions of Scripture, he's like, wrong, you don't know the Bible. Haven't you ever read it? And they're like, Jesus just said that, oh. But think about it. What he's saying is, have you not read? Of course they'd read. But there's a difference between knowing verses and knowing God. There's a difference between knowing verses and knowing Jesus, right? Because the people we see in the Bible that the Bible praises a lot aren't the people that know a lot. They're people that love a lot. Think about David, whose heart's after after God. Think about the lady wiping uh, Jesus' feet with her tears. Think about Mary here, who's sitting at Jesus' feet. The people that are praised are people that love and obey a lot. And they're people whose hearts have been changed, who've been forgiven much, so they love much, right? They've been changed by being with Jesus, and you have that opportunity. You have the opportunity to be with Jesus and have your heart changed by him to where you love much. God reveals himself to us through the Bible. What a privilege, what grace that the creator would reveal himself through the scripture. I love this verse, 1 Corinthians 2, 11 through 12. He says this. Who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? All right, pause for a second. What he's saying is, does anybody else know your thoughts? No, you, only you do, right? Who knows a person's thoughts except for you, all right? And he says, so, same way, nobody comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. That makes sense, right? Nobody knows your thoughts but you. Nobody knows God's thought, thoughts but God's spirit. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. Huh? so that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. That's saying, only you know your thoughts, only God knows God's thoughts through his spirit, but then he gave you that spirit so that you can know God. That is crazy. That's crazy. And he says, and we impart this by words. We put this in the scripture, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit. Man, you study the scripture, make your mornings about one thing and keep looking, I promise you're gonna grow. Let's talk about the second thing is prayer. God also communicates to us and us to him in prayer. You think about Mary listening and talking, you need both. You need to listen to God and you need to talk to God. So let me give a couple reasons why should you pray. Number one, you should pray because God is listening to you. God is listening to you. The creator is listening to you. That that is crazy. The creator and sustainer is in your living room and he wants to hear from you so much so that he commands you to talk to him. He says, talk to me, because we might think, oh, he doesn't want to hear from me. I'm intruding. Absolutely not. He wants to hear from us so much that he commands us to do it. Um, This quote by Mathis, he says this, we're not just servants, we're friends, John 15. We're not just hearers of the word, but his children who have his heart, Romans 8 and Galatians 4. He wants to hear from us, and such is the power and privilege of prayer, that God himself wants to hear from you. It's crazy. Second thing is, why should we pray? Because it, like reading the Bible, is really meeting with God. Picture Mary in the living room. It's meeting with God. Third reason, why should we pray? Because like reading the Bible, prayer transforms us. John 16, 24 says, Until now you've asked nothing in my name, but ask and you'll receive so that your joy may be full. You want to have more joy? We should pray more. Changes us. 
Number four, why should we pray? Because God actually answers prayer. He answers prayer powerfully. James 5 talks about this. He says, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three and a half years, it didn't rain. And then he prayed again and heaven gave rain and the earth bore fruit. That's crazy. He's saying, man, you should pray. You should pray. pray prayer is powerful. And he anticipates that people are going to be like, nah. <laughs> and so he says, you know, Elijah, he was a man just like you are. And he prayed a lot and it didn't rain for three and a half years. He's just a person like you. And he prayed and God answered it. Now, I'm not going to go into all the reasons why God doesn't answer prayer sometimes, prayer, why prayer doesn't work. We can talk about that in different breakouts. But I just want you to dream big for a second because there are huge promises that God makes about prayer. There's huge power in prayer that God promises us over and over and over. And huge closeness through studying the Bible. Both these things, prayer and Bible reading, we're barely scratching the surface of what's possible here. God is in control of all things. And he is your father if you're a Christian. So it makes sense to get close to him as possible and talk to him as often as possible. Jesus gave us a couple of parables to learn how to pray. And Luke 18 is one of my favorites. It says this. He told him a story. Jesus did. To the effect that they should always pray and don't lose heart. And so here's how the story goes. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who did not fear God or respect man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to the judge and saying, give me justice against my adversary. And for a while, the judge refused. But after a while, he said to himself, I don't fear God and I don't respect man. But this widow keeps bothering me. I'll give her justice so she won't beat me down by her continual coming. Pause for a second. This is how Jesus himself is describing prayer. He's saying, it's like, a, it's like, I want you to pray to me like a widow who's bothering a judge and beating him down with her continual coming. Like, what? This is Jesus telling this story. And he says, hear what the unrighteous judge says, Jesus says. Won't God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over him? I tell you, will he give justice to him speedily? Nevertheless, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on earth? What he's saying is, man, this widow kept coming to this judge and saying, give me justice, give me justice, give me justice. And this judge is finally like, shut up. I'm tired of hearing you. I'll give you justice. You keep bothering me. You're going to beat me down. And Jesus says, now, when I, this guy didn't fear God. When I do more for those that I love, but at the last verse is, but when I come back, will I actually find people praying? Will I actually find faith on earth to where people are actually still asking me things? Like, is your faith, is my faith enough to where we're actually asking God for things? So when you pray, let me give two practical tips and we're closing. Three, sorry. When you pray, first practical tip is pick a time and place. Most of us are good at spontaneous prayer. Like, ooh, Jesus, help me with this test. Or, ooh, please don't let us get in a wreck here. Or, please help the clouds to clear up or whatever it is. Most of us are good at spontaneous prayer, but that shouldn't be our one and only plan. Have a time and place to pray. Our second tip. This one's going to be complex. You ready? Pray. That's it. Pray. Talk to God. Just do it. Right? Just do it. You got a bike. Hop on it and ride. The only way you're going to learn how to do it is by by doing it. Read a couple quotes on prayer. Kevin DeYoung says, God has ordered things so that certain events will only take place if we pray. Um, He also says this, Jesus' most frequent teaching on prayer boils down to this, ask. Jesus' most frequent uh, teaching on prayer is pray, do it, just do it. This guy, Philip Reichen, he says this, we will accomplish more by praying than by all of our doing. Man, that's the most frequent, frequent teaching that Jesus says on prayer is pray, pray, just do it, just talk to him, right? And you might have different methods for prayer and for Bible study that work for you, right? But as in Bible study, as long as you're looking, 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 and for prayer, as long as you're talking to God, not just bringing a request list, but as long as you're actually talking to God, right? We don't really need to be told how to pray. We don't need an acrostic to figure it out. Maybe those things are helpful for you. Great, if they are. But the widow asking for justice, she didn't need methods to learn how to pray. She just needed to keep asking, right? The last tip on prayer. Well, let let me say this first before I jump in the last tip. Uh, I think you can put in different things that would be helpful for you in prayer. Like, I know what works for me and what doesn't. For me, if I sit down and pray, I'm done. If I stay quiet 
and pray, I'm done. I'm derailed. Because if I sit down and start thinking prayers, I'll get bored and I'll get derailed. And I'll be like thinking in my head, oh, Jesus, I pray for my wife. And uh, what are we doing today? I'm hungry. And then I'll just be gone and I'll be like, 20 minutes, huh? What was I doing? You know? Uh, but like for me, I've found out that for me personally, I have to be moving, like walking, and I have to say it out loud or I'll derail. I'll just be like thinking, and I'll be like, basketball, and I'll go somewhere else. But if I'm walking and speaking out loud, I know that works for me. You need to find what works for you because you're going to ride a bike a little bit differently than I do, right? But the generality is going to be the same. We're both going to be on the bike riding, right? I think about this in Bible study too. We, we had a small group over here with our staff and we're talking about Bible study. And I was like, what do you guys do? And one guy was like, well, I like to write the passage out over and over and over. And I'm like, great, what do you do? And he said, I like to actually read the passage out loud over and over. And I'm like, great. And I asked another guy, what do you do? And he said, I have three questions I ask on each text. And I said, great, what do you do? And everybody had something different, but what was the same? They're all looking, looking looking, looking. You might have a little bit different method of prayer, but you're praying, you're praying, you're doing it. Most of us just need the encouragement to stop and make some unhurried space in our day. That's it. Make some unhurried space in your day. Make your mornings about one thing. That means sometimes when your phone buzzes, I've done this so many times. I've taken my phone and shoved it off my desk and said, nope, one thing. Because I want to, like, or an idea will hop in my head. I'll be like, oh, I'll just Google it real quick. And I'll be like, no, one thing. Because I know I'll get derailed. So make your mornings, make unharried space. And make your mornings about one thing. The last tip on prayer is don't fall into ruts. We fall into ruts so quickly in prayer. Well, we we're guilty of this in my family because my six-year-old son said, Daddy, when you pray, why is it like a different language? And I was like, do what? I thought it was getting weird, but he, he was like, no, because you, you say before every line, you say, and we pray. And I was like, oh, shoot, I've fallen into some ruts. I'm like, and we pray for Knox, and we pray for our house, we pray for this, and we pray for this, and we pray for this. He's like, it's kind of like a different language. And I was like, man, I'm sorry, I've kind of fallen into ruts. I mean, you get into this where you fall into the rut of saying the same thing every time. This guy, uh, Don Whitney, says the result, if we're falling into ruts, the result is we can be talking to the most fascinating person in the universe about the most important things in our lives and be bored to death. Don't fall into ruts. Man, you're having a conversation with Jesus. You're making it about one thing. So in closing, don't get distracted. There are billions of things that will distract you. Don't get distracted by many things like Martha. Make your mornings about one thing. Prayer and Bible reading, meeting with and talking to Jesus. You don't need more tips. You don't need more teachers. Our issues aren't usually that we need better methods. It's usually that we just aren't doing it. So if you meet with God every day, I promise it's going to be life changing. You're going to be changed every day because the creator is in your living room. So pick up the scripture. Take time in prayer. Listen, hear, and look, 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 look. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray that you would help uh, these guys and me to have meaningful time in your word, to have meaningful time in prayer. I pray that you would help us to have the discipline to have some unhurried space in our day where we can put all other distractions, even good distractions, away. And we can make that time just about one thing, about meeting with you. I pray that you would help us to look, look, look at the scripture. I pray you would help us to be fervent in prayer, knowing that it's effective, knowing that you tell us, just pray, just pray. And so, God, I pray that for just a minute each day, just for a little while, that we'd push all of the distractions out, make it about one thing. And I pray we'd grow in a huge way as a result. I thank you for these students that are here because they want to grow. They're sitting in a session that's optional about Bible study because they want to grow. And I pray that you would bless that effort with real discipline to study the Bible. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.